So hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Margaret Stern, and I'm the Communications and Outreach Manager for the Sioux Sitna River Coalition. And welcome to our February Winter Speaker event, all about riparian zones and why they are important. Um, before we get started and before I hand over the screen to Jess Johnson with Fish and Game, who's going to tell us all about these uh, this interesting habitat, um, I'd like to thank the um, our sponsors, the Chase Community Council, the Talkeetna Community Council, and the Jessica Stevens Foundation. We also have a number of generous individual donors, and we really rely on their support um, for our organization's success. Um, so before I hand it over to Jess, I'll give a brief introduction to her. Jess is currently the habitat biologist with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and she has been the program lead for the cost share program since September of 2017. During this time, she has worked on over 75 rehabilitation projects all over the state and has worked with private landowners, public land managers, and other land conservation partners to help rehabilitate and protect stream banks. She has also taught approximately 20 stream bank rehabilitation workshops throughout the state. And prior to her work with ADF and G, Jess was a fisheries biologist on joint base Elmendorf at J Bear, carrying out fisheries studies and working on restoration projects. Jess earned a Bachelor's of Science in Fisheries Management from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and a Graduate Certificate in Fisheries Management from Oregon State University. So thank you, Jess, so much for being here tonight and sharing all uh, sharing your presentation and knowledge with us. And I will pass the screen over to you. All right. Um, thank you. And I'm impressed that Melissa and Margaret are able to like record this on Facebook and on Zoom. I Yeah. That's way above my ability. So um, you'll just have to bear with me. I'm going to try to get my presentation up. So I'm going to do a screen share here and hopefully it goes smoothly. All right, I think I think that's working now. Um, so as it was stated, you know, I've been working with the department for uh, going on six years now. I probably have more than 75 um, restoration projects underneath my belt. Um, I've taught numerous workshops. Um, throughout, mainly it's been, you know, Anchorage, Kenai, um, Matsu, and then Fairbanks area. Um, so some of what you've heard, if you've ever taken one of my restoration uh, workshops will be the same, or if you've taken um, a restoration workshop from um, one of my previous uh, predecessors, some of this might be kind of a review for you. Um, but it's still kind of interesting information. And this is kind of an area that's always kind of you're learning, it's growing, things have changed. Um, so it's kind of fun to look at. Uh, so it's kind of offered here to kind of talk about the importance of riparian habitat. Um, and, you know, just because I focus on salmon and what I do is salmon, um, a lot of what I, a lot of what we do along the riparian areas to stabilize stream banks also takes a role and plays into um, land mammals and other uh, species, birds, et cetera. So I'm gonna jump right on in here. See if I can get this to work. So the first thing I kind of wanted to talk about was a little bit about like water velocities. I would be amiss, I think, um, if I wasn't talking about the importance of riparian habitat, if we didn't talk about um, the importance of rivers and just to like reiterate that rivers um, move. They, you know, if you look across the map, they move across the floodplain. Um, you have a lot of different varieties of rivers. You got everything from you know, Willow Creek is a fairly small river that can be flashy. And then for the people up in Talkeetna, you've got, you know, the Talkeetna River coming in, you've got the Susitna and I believe the Chulitna. Um, so we're talking wide varieties um, of rivers. And what when we're just talking about rivers and riparian habitat, you can also apply this similar to um, lakes and how lakes need riparian habitats too. And like, how riparian habitats vary within lakes and all that, but the basics across the board are the same. So in this presentation, I was just um, just gonna kind of show here in this particular slide, you know, your water velocities um, kind of affect erosion. So in this case, we've got a stream on the side here. I don't know if people can, hopefully you can see my cursor here, but you've got a stream here, the water's flowing the black arrows, and then you've got these cross sections. So what the water does, you've got your fastest velocity coming here and I'll bounce off banks. And so if we look at cross section A, you can see you've got this um, pool of maximum velocity and then you've got minimum velocity. 
and you've got this brown. This brown represents um, like sediment falling out. So if you've got fine silts and other deposit, that's just kind of settling out here because your faster velocity is against this cut bank. And then if you go to the section B, it just, it's kind of a straightaway. So your maximum velocity of the water is gonna be kind of in the center. And as you come down to C, um, you can see it's just switched directions. And so now it's on the opposite side where you're starting to get like a sandbar, uh, sandbar um, gravel bar, depending on your radius. And so it, just kind of a rule of thumb is like your water velocity slows down, it drops some of its sediment load. So the heavier particles drop out first. So if you get like a really flashy or steep gradient, you'll have large boulders um, down to, I like to think of like the Mississippi, the Delta of Mississippi, you've got really the fine sediments there. Um, that they will end up being depositive because the water is just so slow and um, the river so wide. So another thing to kind of take into consideration when I say rivers move is you've got different types of rivers and different types of rivers function differently. You've got everything from a braided stream and a really good example in the Matanuska Valley is actually the Matanuska River. Um, it's a super wide braided stream and you've got small little um, streams and creeks that have just meanders, just really slow moving. I guess um, Was uh, Wasilla Creek would be a good example of this. And then you've got the in-betweens. And uh, depending on how these streams are set up, you've got, you know, for example, lost my cursor here, you've got um, more of a bed load with your sediments versus suspended load. So suspended is uh, your fine, like think of sands and silts that'll kind of float in the water where your bed load will be like the larger rocks and cobbles that'll um, go down the stream, just kind of roll on the bottom. Um, and if you kind of work yourself down, you've got stability of the banks when you're braided uh, streams or like the Matanuska, the banks aren't as stable, but in your smaller um, streams, they're, they're super uh, stable or not super stable, they're more stable. Um, so that's just kind of to kind of get people to think, you know, yes, rivers move. Um, and so in a braided stream, you'll get the river at any given time can branch out. It can swing from side to side in different areas. The meanders and these ones, they just get windier and curvier until they like run into each other. And then you create oxbows and then you've got everything in between. Um, so I'm going to jump in and kind of give an example of um, Montana Creek here. Uh, this is along Kalispell Road, which just to let you know, that is my hometown. So I love talking about this slide. Um, as you can see here, we've got two different colors and I apologize to anyone who might be colorblind. Um, we do have blue here, which is where this channel actually was in 2012. And then we've got this green here, which is where the channel was um, in July of 2018. And we like to show this one, just showing how much these rivers move. Um, we've got a lot of little parcels. So the yellow lines here on top are just parcels. Um, and these parcels just kind of show you, just to kind of show like this river has really, really moved. Um, and in this case, like I think like maybe this location way over here, the river moved in six years over 130 feet. Um, if you think of like the Kenai, um, you'll get movement of maybe it's a, the Kena is a super stable river. You get maybe movement of one foot to either direction up to maybe five feet a year. So not a whole lot. Um, the Yukon River, you might get 40 feet. Um, so it, each stream is different. And that's something I like to point out is each stream is different, um, but rivers move. And that's one important thing that I like to point out um, is that rivers move. And then this particular map is just of LIDAR. So what it is, it just um, was removed all the vegetation, removed everything, and we're just down to like looking at bare earth for the most part. And again, um, this is where the channel was in 2012. Um, and then this red line here indicates where the channel used to be. This is where the channel used to be. A lot of these little squiggly gray lines, uh, so to speak, is where the channel moves to. The other red line that we have here this is kind of a plateau, a higher area. And this signifies, this is as far over as this river, as Montana Creek will likely go. Um, it's, this is all part of its floodplains. The other thing I like to point out is uh, humans have used rivers for thousands of millions of years to transport um, goods up and down rivers. It was kind of the first mode of transportation. You think about it, you jump in a boat, head downstream. And so we build our lots and properties, you know, right along streams. So 
if you think about like these properties, this is all based on where, you know, maybe in the 70s um, when these plots or lots were built, this is where the river was. So I guarantee you these probably followed the river quarter at some point in time. And now the river is actually taken most of these lots up in this area. So kind of getting into a little bit more of uh, why you guys uh, are here is to kind of talk about habitat and riparian habitat. Um, so we like to kind of just break down what habitat is and give a basic definition, um, something I think most of us probably learned at some point in time in elementary school. Um, habitat is a place where a plant or animal can get the food, water, shelter, and space it needs to live. Um, pretty simple there. And then, you know, as you talk about functions of riparians uh, to streams and or to habitat, um, we get a lot of different functions of a riparian, um, specifically along the stream. It helps clean water, uh, helps stabilize banks. It provides shading to the waterways. So think of like how on those hot days, um, you know, when it we're scorching and it's like 80 plus degrees or, you know, depending on where you're at, 85 degrees, we much rather be underneath the tree canopy versus sitting in a gravel pit. Um, so think of kind of the same way there. Um, Riparians provide food for both terrestrial and aquatic organisms. So you've got, you know, birds that might be uh, chewing or uh, targeting insects, and yet the aquatic, like fish, might also target insects that fall into the water. It gives a refuge during flooding events, um, meaning that as the water rises, it and goes tops the banks, it goes out into the vegetation, it slows down those velocities, and so juvenile fish can kind of get into that and have a, they don't have to struggle so much against the, the current. Um, it also puts woody debris into the waterways, which in turn creates more habitat for aquatic organisms. So um, what is the riparian and what is it, why is it so important? So um, again, just basic, some basic stuff. Riparian is relating to an area adjacent to rivers and lakes. Um, it's a type of habitat that occurs along the banks of and is influenced by a stream or lake and typically consists of water tolerant trees or shrubs, such as alder, cottonwood, willows. So I've kind of got like a, a simple diagram here. Um, if this is your lake or stream, you can have a riparian area in here and then you'll have your uplands. Um, there is no, there is no one size buffer fits, uh, riparian area fits all. Each riparian is different for every stream. It varies, you know, amongst um, streams as you get like maybe a mile down a stream, it might, the riparian uh, area might be larger or it might be smaller. Um, but the main thing is like plants that live in this riparian area is they have to be tolerant to um, water because that's, these are the areas that are going to flood frequently. So if you think about your conifers, so um, white spruce, or if you're from like the lower 48, you got your larch, your blue spruce, all that, they can't handle a lot of um, flooded, getting the roots wet and flooding, but your cottonwood trees can, your willows, your alders, um, and some of your native grasses. Um, and one takeaway, because you know we talk about erosion quite a bit, and one takeaway is we like to tell people erosion isn't a dirty word. Um, and if, if you look at this, you've got some channel migration. This is another LIDAR. So channel migration, it's gonna take down some um, trees as it kind of moves across, but this, these trees as they fall into stream create more habitat for aquatic vegetation uh, or aquatic organisms such as, um, uh, oh, I cannot think of them. They're EPTs. I know all the fly fishermen out here are like, these are nymphs and stoneflies, caddis. So it's caddis, stoneflies, and I cannot remember the third one to save my life. Um, but they help break down the trees. So in turn, it gives um, hiding places for fish. And it also forms pools and riffles, which fish also need. And so this is kind of a circular motion. But on the flip side, as the um, channel is migrating such like up here, this is creating new habitat. And a lot of the times your willows kind of grow on this, which is perfect moose browse for willows to get in, get some moose uh, or get some browse, some different type of vegetation that it needs. And um, as the channel erodes, you think about it, salmon in particular need uh, spawning gravel. And each salmon has a different size and type of gravel they like. Um, 
to build their nests on or reds. And so if we're not getting inputs from the land and your gravel just keeps washing down, you kind of lose uh, the ability to build a, a nest. So um, some functions of riparian areas, um, they, the trap, they, they trap and remove um, sediment from runoff. Um, so let's say, I like to give an example, and it's a super extreme example, um, but like if there's a highway right next to the stream and you know bridges are good at this and a street sweeper comes along and just pushes, is it sweeping, it's just got a bunch of dirt and loose gravel and all that, it would end up in the river if there was no buffer, but as a buffer, it kind of helps slow the sediment down from, and then runoff. So it's like it pours down rain and that sediment kind of moves off the street. It doesn't go directly into the stream or lake. It kind of has an area to kind of settle out and stops in the vegetation. Kind of the same thing. Um, it helps trap and remove uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, which um, we as humans love to use on our lawns because we love lush green lawns. Um, and it also, and a lot of those can help um, to eutrophication of aquatic, meaning it's too rich, it's too nutrient, um, so it, it kind of can kill, but it, it just help, it just makes the living area not livable for fish. And then also kind of helps uh, reduce um, pesticides. So think of it as like, is you're spraying your pesticide on your lawn. If you have like a really nice buffer area, the pesticide in the first rain isn't just going to wash off into the stream or uh, lake, it'll actually have time to kind of percolate and sink down. Um, riparian areas also uh, stay, help stabilize bank and re reduce channel erosion. Um, and yes, you like I said, erosion isn't always a dirty word, um, but having vegetation along your stream banks and allowing your stream to be able to move um, helps, helps slow the erosion rate down. Um, and one thing that I like this, like this photo is from the Koyukuk River, but a reason why I like to use it is you can see right here, we've got a pool of water here and we've got another, um, it looks like maybe an old oxbow here too. And so it stores, as the river starts to flood, it'll help and floods into this uh, pool of water. It'll help slow and give an area for this area to fill before all that water rushes downstream. And then that water as it recedes can just sit there and kind of percolate. So it kind of stores water um, and it can also, de that helps decrease um, property damage, helps decrease um, as high velocity to cause erosion. So just having your riparian buffer really allows your rivers to be able to move and um, do, what, do what rivers naturally do. Um, so some more functions of this, this is uh, Wasilla Lake. I think it's Newcomb Park as you're coming into Wasilla there. Um, they also help maintain like habitat for fish and other aquatic uh, organisms and meaning, um, you know, it's providing temperature, it's providing woody debris, um, it provides habitat for uh, terrestrial organisms. So in this case, I absolutely love this photo. I think it, I took it in 2019 and that particular summer, we were having all kinds of forest fires and it was just hot. I just remember it being hot, um, wet wading into here. I didn't even see this mallard with her, whoops, I went too fast. I didn't see the mallard with her, her babies until she popped out from underneath. Her and her um, babies were actually hiding underneath the willows that were planted here, uh, just soaking up the shade, probably provides habitat. It, um, so if a hawk or an eagle is flying by, they don't have a chance to like zoom down and pick up one of her chicks or ducklings. I think they're ducklings. I am not a bird person, so I apologize. Um, and then, you know, as other aquatic, you can get, um, one of my coworkers talks about the neonato birds, um, neonate, neonato something. It, um, and there's a huge migration between Alaska and like, you know, um, Central America and these neonatal birds actually use a lot of the riparian corridors, um, to get up into, and they use them to feed. They've got aquatic insects. They can build their nests. They're, they're usually a lot cooler. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, ways that maintaining a riparian buffer um, will help your just maintain. Um, the other thing is, you know, it provides recreational and educational opportunities. So what I really like, and it's hard to see because I've got this purple um, 
box over the top of it is that this project was done in 2012 and I believe it was done by the Wasilla um, Soil and Water Conservation District Youth Group uh, and it was like 2012 or 2010 and they actually put up a split rail fence around this and what you can't see off to the other side is they kind of came back and did some others and left some open areas but they put the the fence up um, to help protect this area at the meantime the city also uh, created an area for people to be able to go off and swim. So we've got some kids kind of swimming in the background here. So it's offering kind of a little bit of everything. We're still maintaining some healthy habitats for both, like I said, aquatics and in um, terrestrial in organisms. And we're still being able to recreate along this property. Um, there was a study, and I can't quite remember it off the top of my head, but it... Um, something about 80% of all um, living organisms use riparian areas um, within um, at some point in time in their life. And I, I can't, like I said, I can't remember the who, who it was off the top of my head, but um, it's somewhere around 80%. So at some point in time, most organisms, terrestrial or aquatic, will use riparian habitat um, at some point in their, their life. So um, I'm going to go into a couple things of what causes uh, bank instability. So <clears throat> bank instability is caused by lack of riparian buffers, channelization, and a, a good one I kind of talk about for channelization is like um, famous one is the LA River. Um, as we all know, the, we've all seen photos of the LA River where it's concrete on both sides, concrete on the bottom. That's that's a really good one. Over-exaggerated channelization, but that's uh, a good one. Uh, development, so, you know, recreating along stream banks, whether it's um, building parks or if it's, um, you know, fishermen trying to access areas to fish. Um, but with development comes impervious surfaces. And when I talk about impervious surfaces, I'm talking about like concrete, asphalt, um, even some of the compact gravel um, that you do, you lay down the um, landscaping fabric and then pour gravel on top and really get it compact. Um, those all cause a lot of instability in your banks. Um, and I, I like to, when we say lack of um, riparian buffers and or like vegetation, um, one thing that I've noticed is, you know, we're humans. We love looking at rivers. We have lived along rivers for thousands of years, so we like to come in and if it's a brand new property, we'll uh, remove all the vegetation so that we can get our river access. Um, but when you think about it, your native vegetation, our native Alaskan vegetation, holds those soils in place similar to what rebar does for concrete. So when you're thinking about concrete um, and rebar, those are like how those hold together, our veget our roots of our native vegetation hold the soils in place. Um, so this is a really cool, I like this quote by um, Beeson and Doyle um, from 95. It says, banks without riparian vegetation were found to be nearly five times as likely as vegetative banks to undergo detectable erosion during flood events. Basically, you are five times more likely to see um, <clears throat> erosion occurring along your bank if you didn't have vegetation versus if you had vegetation. Um, and I know lots of people like their lawns right to the river. Lawn grass, you know, it only maybe has roots like this, but if you get your willows or your native um, beach rye and other grasses native to Alaska, you, you can get foot or more long. Um, I like to kind of point some of these photos out. Um, my predecessor you know, on this particular photo with the house that looks like it's right there, you can see the steps coming out. That particular landowner, when they built the house and or, or if they bought that house, I can't remember, they had over a quarter mile between that house and that river. And that is along the Matanuska River. Um, and this is what this is what happened. It just ended up shortly just moving because like I said, the Matanuska River is a very braided river and it moves quite a bit. Um, and a couple of these other photos, just over time, as we have humans have lived there, things have kind of ended up just kind of fallen, fallen in, rivers move. 
Um, here's just an overall view. This is kind of a cool shot. Um, you've got your stream or your river, at the I can never pronounce this name. The name of the river is down below there. Um, oh, do I have a, yes, I've got a laser pointer, even better. Um, so you've got your river that's kind of flowing this way as it kind of flows out of the screen here, but you've got your floodplain and your floodplain, um, this is kind of what allows the river to kind of move back and forth. So over in over here and here's our uplands. So the river really isn't gonna move into uplands. The other interesting thing to see is you can see, you know, we've got probably some cottonwoods in here. Um, you've maybe got some black spruce kind of growing. We've got some really vegetated along these banks, but then once you kind of get into the uplands, you kind of lose some of that green richness. Um, so the rivers really do have these amazing floodplains. And like I said, humans, we've, we've used rivers and streams for thousands, millions of years. And so it's only natural for us as humans to want to be right next to rivers. But in this case, you know, this, this particular river in this area is allowed to kind of move between just meander and change its channel. And you can tell at some point in time, the channel used to, used to flow through here. There's still remnants. Um, so one thing I'm just going to kind of point out here is that um, development in riparian areas happens. This is the Kenai River in 1975. Um, I believe the Soldatna Airport is summers right in here. And then this is it, uh, same, same area in 1998. I tried to get an updated photo, but I just can't quite get the photos to match. But as humans come in, you know, your impervious surfaces, again, those are like asphalt, compact gravel, um, concrete increases, your, our, the riparian buffers decrease, your floodplain conductivity decreases because we want to keep the river right there. We don't want it to be able to meander. Our storm water inputs increases. We have higher peak flooding uh, discharges, our sediment loads increase and erosion increases. Um, So, you know, looking back at how we, when we've moved there, we get um, all kinds of things. We as humans like to try to um, prevent the stream from flowing. We want to contain it in the channel that it's in now for the rest of its in perpetuity, really. Um, so, you know, we have goals to keep, keep it there. We don't want it to move. Um, we do... We do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, I believe this is the Chena River up in Fairbanks. Um, in this particular case, the landowner found I don't, quite a few um, milk crates and just filled them with, with rock and put them up because he had a hole here. Um, and in this case, it actually just made the erosion worse and it, it was just eroding behind, um, behind it. Um, I worked, my predecessor worked with um, the Fish and Wildlife Service person up in Fairbanks, and then we're able to get this fixed. But humans, it's just an example of what humans have tried to do to protect um, our, our land, our property. Um, and this, you know, this isn't necessarily, this isn't great fish habitat. This maybe down here is great fish habitat. Um, we also, we think removing the vegetation will help because, well, then these trees won't fall in. Um, we've also, I'd like to say when we heighten the bank, um, a good example is probably like the levees along the Mississippi River, if you think about that, how they've just built levees to heighten the bank, so to kind of keep the Mississippi River contained within that channel. Um, I'm sure we've all seen different areas. Um, I believe the Klutna Tail Race, if you've ever walked there, is lined with what I like to call Detroit riprap, also known as old cars. Um, so I'm sure we, we've seen a thousand different ways humans have tried to do some of this. Um, well, so this is kind of a cool little video. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the water stream tables. Um, that's what this is. And I'm just gonna run it. Um, it just kind of shows when you've got vegetation, this will kind of be our vegetation here. And this is just kind of loose sand. And so they run, I believe three floods through here. And then they have another experiment where they run um, I know we don't have oceans, but um, we do have large lakes like Big Lake in the area. Um, and it just kind of shows like wind driven waves and what they can do. Uh, 
the particular one has to do with mangroves, but it just shows how mangroves along a beach can help protect areas. So I'm gonna just play this. I'm gonna fast forward to through this a little bit and turn off the volume. Um, so let's see. So here you'll just see that this is just the general normal flows. So you've got your vegetation kind of through here and then You'll notice this area starts moving uh, quite a bit um, and it'll, it'll tell you when a flood comes up here. So here's flood one. And you can see erosion really happening, things changing. But for the most part, this stays. We might have some water that is just restored, like just stored in there. And so you can see by the third flood, this is moved, you know, it used to be up there. And so this is just kind of a wave um, maker in like a mangrove. And so here's the vegetation and then here is without vegetation. I believe these little cubes are just, just kind of be like structures such as houses or something. And this might be a little lagoon or lake. So this just runs and shows some waves as waves hit it. And you can see the waves just kind of take out this lagoon and take out the sign. Um, so it's, it's kind of a fun little video that I just like to show. I just have to figure out how to leave the video now. Okay. All right, Melissa and Margaret, I might be stuck here trying to get out of this. Let's see. Oh, may have got it. Perfect. Nope. <laughs> Dang it. Huh. Let me see if I can hit escape again. Okay. Ah, okay. Got it. Thank you. Um, so those are kind of just some ways humans interact um, with riparian areas. And now I'm just going to get a little bit into fish and fish habitat. I, I mean, I am technically a fisheries biologist and we do as humans love our salmons, especially here in Alaska. And so I always, I, yeah, I can't get away without showing a few fish photos. Um, this is just kind of a cool shot along, I believe it's Wasilla Creek. Um, and you can tell in this case, there's a lot of good riparian habitat. We've got a lot of ferns, you've got shading, you got a lot of tall tree canopy, um, you've got some, some woody debris uh, just kind of hanging out here, some wood, you've got just kind of a cool shot. I like to use it. And so again, my program, we really focus on fish habitat. Um, and so we all as humans like to go catch like, you know, the large salmon. That's what we like, it puts food on our table. It's what we like to fish for, but really protecting these stream, like not stabilizing stream bank um, habitats and restoring rehabilitating stream bank habitats. We're really concentrated on our juvenile salmon here. And so just so people know, like this is a coho, um, also known as a silver, this is a Chinook, also known as a King. And then this is your sockeye, also known as a red. Um, and these uh, life species of these three salmon are usually like one to three years in freshwater. And so that's kind of why we focus on them. Your kinks and your chums, as soon as they emerge from the um, eggs and the gravel, they usually head straight to the ocean. So that's why I really, we concentrate a lot on these um, three species here. And so our habitats provide natural, um, what, they, what they need are like complex natural uh, structures. And it provides, you know, optimal juvenile salmon rearing. So like, I like to point out this photo. So along the Kenai, this landowner uh, just bought the property and he did, there's no really erosion issues because the bank is doing, it's supposed to be doing, it's got a lot of tall columagrastis grass. We've got some willows. Um, had some beetle kill spruce trees, um, but it had a lot of riparian. 
he just wanted access. Um, but, and he was, he was fine having these irregular. And what I like to show is that this is really irregular. It's not a perfectly straight line. Humans like, you know, perfectly straight square 90 degree turns. This is great juvenile habitat because they can kind of get in amongst these little um, areas and kind of hide from predators. Your um, velocities kind of go down. Having these irregular shorelines kind of breaks your water velocity speeds. Um, optimal juvenile salmon rearing habitat. Um, so with these and allowing these trees to kind of fall in, uh, I know this is kind of an older photo, but it's just showing some woody debris and you've got some juvenile salmon hanging out and about these juvenile within this debris and um, like coho are their territorial. So having this, this area allows each one of them to have little micro territories that they can defend, go out into the uh, deeper water, grab their prey and come back and consume it. Um, so, you know, again, these all provide shelter for juvenile salmon by, you know, providing low water velocities. Um, this breaks up the low water velocity or breaks up the water velocity. This will also break it up. And it also per, um, provides protection for predation. Um, so think about like a merganser or something. They can, these juveniles can kind of get in here and hide maybe a little bit from the mergansers or um, a kingfisher that might be targeting them. Um, it also, you know, provides substrate from uh, microinvertebrates, which might be food source for um, the salmon. I like, I like this photo kind of down here is, you know, it's showing substrate that you might have some um, aquatic insects feeding on that uh, fish can consume. It also, in case, I don't know if anyone noticed, there is a slimy sculpin right here. So I like to point this out too, because I think this is a really cool photo. You can see the slimy sculpin. Um, it's a little hard, but it's just great camouflage. So you can see how, like in this case, this camouflage helps. So, and it also, these also provide optimal temperatures. Um, it's shade in both those upper photos. And another takeaway point, um, since I pointed out the slimy sculpt in there, is that, you know, what we may be focused specifically on the salmon um, here in Alaska, but what we do from the salmon is also going to is also going to help your um, rainbows or steelheads. It'll help your uh, dolly varden. It'll help. Um, well, Arctic char, it'll help grayling. So it also is a benefit um, to those other fish species, our resident fish species. Um, okay, here's the, here's the boring part of the talk. I've kind of got some graphs here and um, note that a lot of this is based on Chinook habitat. And a lot of that is, um, part of it is Chinook have been studied a lot. They're kind of the big, you know, the big salmon species. Um, if you look up and down the West Coast, a lot of the Chinook um, salmon have been lost um, due to whatever, if it's like the dams on uh, the Columbia River. So a lot of studies have actually just been done on Chinook, but a lot of these will also pertain to the other salmon and other habitats. So um, this particular uh, study just kind of shows that uh, juvenile salmon, you know, their optimal velocity that they need for um, survival is between 0.3 and 0.6 feet per second. It's, that's not very fast. And that they also need a depth of about one foot to maybe one and a half feet is kind of their optimal habitat. Um, and so having that and just um, stabilizing the stream banks really helps to maintain a lot of their optimal uh, velocities and depths that they might need. Um, here's just kind of another, another study from uh, 86 on, it's an index, it's a suitability index. And again, I, like I said, a lot of this stuff was done for Chinook. Um, but I, what I like to point out too is um, anything that's close to one mean it, means it's optimal for um, salmon. So undercut banks, again, like I said, anything close to one uh, is good. So un, uh, un, undercut banks is phenomenal for uh, salmon. And so we may see it as erosion, but to them, it's a place that they can kind of get in under. It's got shade, it's got uh, shelter, it's, you know, providing protection for them. So that's great. The next one up is debris. So think about um, 
log jams or just trees falling into the river that yeah might catch your boat motor but they're important for juvenile salmon um, and then you kind of get into aquatic vegetation so anything that's growing from the bottom of a stream or lake that grows from there and comes up into the water column and the last two are kind of um, overhanging vegetation and emergent vegetation um, and that's emergent vegetation is like what's just what peaks out of the so if it grows from the water and then comes up and it's the leaves and all that stuff are on top of the water. So those kind of fit. And then this is just kind of a graph that shows similar, similar thing, just kind of helps two different visuals. And then finally, um, again, another juvenile or uh, Chinook salmon on the Sacramento River. And this was done, uh, this study was done by Helmer in 2008. And really what it's showing is that you've got the mean number of juvenile salmon per point. So um, the study, they went up and down the Sacramento River. Uh, they dropped, they sampled specific points for salmon. It's sampled in natural um, habitats. They sampled and mitigated, which um, in this case would be rehabilitated was what we would call it. And then they sampled in rock. Um, so like this is an example, maybe it was a farmer or someone who came along, cleared all of the land, and then, oh no, we're having erosion issues. We'll just throw rock in. Um, so if you if you look at this, your natural vegetation, you're going to have a lot more salmon utilizing uh, the stream banks that have natural vegetation compared to what you're going to find um, utilizing the rocky. Um, there's not really that much habitat for salmon um, with rocks. And then the mitigated here, meaning, oh shoot, you know, we have all this rock, maybe we need to try to fix it. And so we'll, we'll throw in some wood, we'll make sure we get some vegetation growing along. You'll actually get more salmon utilizing that than what you actually would with rock revetment. Um, and I think that was, I can't remember the off the top of my head, but it was like 200% more salmon or something like that will utilize the mitigated opposed to rock. Um, so I think that is the end of, oh, nope, got one more. Um, and this is, this is a coho study off the Sashin Creek, which I think is in Southeast Alaska. Um, and it's probably the early eighties again. And the basic takeaway is if you've got a female that's able to spawn about 2000 eggs. And again, these salmon think like one to two years, um, in fresh water for coho by the time the fish are migrating out to the ocean, you've, you've got less than half a percent of those salmon survived. So, um, and then they've got to, you know, they've got to survive the ocean, they've got to survive coming back to be able to spawn. So if we, um, you know, if we can try to anyway help, help provide um, riparian habitats for these salmon, it might help give a better survival. Um, it's, Surely my thoughts would. Um, so I think that's it. The one thing I wanted to point out is that the Matsu Salmon uh, Partnership, I don't know how many people are familiar. Um, I, didn't, I couldn't provide a link, but they actually have put together a healthy stream bank support healthy salmon. It's a really cool little pamphlet that talks about what riparian uh, areas provide, uh, human activities resulting to impacts, and best management practices. Um, and that can actually be found on their website. Um, so it's a really cool pamphlet. If you wanna learn more about it, um, you can actually, like I said, find it on their website. And I think that's it. So I'm gonna stop, um, I'm gonna stop sharing and then I think we can answer questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Jess. That's a really comprehensive presentation. Um, we do have a couple questions for you. One of them is, would a grass lawn be considered an impervious surface? Or, yeah. mm. uh, that one's a hard question. I would say probably not because you will likely get some percolation of water through there, but it's just not going to hold your sediment as well because we've seen time and time again where I've taken pictures where grass lawns are only got roots like that. And then if I go look at, um, you know, maybe their next door neighbor just has uh, native vegetation growing and I'm, I'm 
talking like two or three feet of um, root structure. So I don't know if I would necessarily call it impervious. I think of impervious is, like I said, hardened gravel that we've put or concrete asphalt type stuff. And then I had a question about, we, uh, there was a mention of like pesticides and runoff and then it percolating down. And does that simply decrease the, the general amount that then ends up and kind of spread out the effects? Um, how does that work? You know, one thing, I don't know if, um, one thing that I've seen a lot it, with is um, rain gardens and bioswells. Um, we've got examples in Anchorage of bioswells, like if you go to the Muldoon um, exit and Glen Highway, I think it's still the Glen Highway there, they've got a the bunch of those bioswells. And the thought of that is, is your sediment and other, other contaminants, so it might not just be pesticides, it can be whatever falls off your car, gas, oil, that just all sits there and kind of percolates. Um, I am not a chemist well enough to know how, a biochemist well enough to know how like if your natural soils and stuff will break that down or if it'll just sit there in the soils. Um, it, and if it, you know, will eventually like make its way to the river, it just might take a lot longer versus two minutes, maybe it'll take 10 years. I'm not, I'm not well adverse in that and I apologize for that. Fine, thank you. Um, another question is you've done a lot of restoration projects. So how do you, as you're approaching a site, what are you looking for and how are you assessing those sites and what you're going to bring in? So that's always a hard one because um, no two sites are the same. So when I, you know, we talk about, we've got some tools in our toolbox, um, like as I like to call them. Um, we've got everything from I've worked with landowners up in Fairbanks and we've asked them to stop mowing their lawn and we gave them some birch trees and said stop mowing your lawn once you reach the birch trees and man that's done the job. Um, other times we have to go what we call our Cadillac which is root wads. Um, and so no two projects are same but we've got a gamut of tools that we can try to use and so you know we talk to the landowners um, because a lot of times the landowners uh, we'll know exactly what has been done on their property. Um, example is working on the Casilla. Um, my partner and I were out there talking to the landowner and he actually was there during this, what was it, 64 earthquake? And he said that the water actually flew, uh, started flowing back towards the lake and that after the earthquake, things had changed. So just talking to them and learning, landowners got a lot of history usually, um, sometimes not. Sometimes we meet brand new landowners that bought the property two months ago. But we asked, what, what do they want? Like, what do you envision using your property for? Because um, that's important. Like, we, we do want to make sure people can use their property. Um, so I, I can't really answer that, but we start looking for, you know, do they have, do we have a riparian buffer to work with? And is everything intact? Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? Like the one photo where I showed that irregular bank with all that grass. That motor landowner didn't have any issues. He just wanted access. So we helped um, helped him with what we call elevated light penetrating walkways that allowed him access, but kept the bank stable enough with all the native vegetation. Um, other times we might find a spot or two, we have to do some sort of bioengineering as we call it. Cool. It's, yeah, it's not an easy answer. As varied as all the sites, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, Sharon asks, as a hiker, backpack, and backpacker, are there things you can do to help these habitats or prevent more harm? Um, yeah, I, I, I believe so. Um, as, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, ATVs, we, Matsu Valley has a lot of ATV use, um, and there are ways to cross streams, um, and use, utilize streams, especially if you're hiking too. Obviously, if you're hiking, you're gonna look for, first of all, the safest place to cross streams. But, um, you know, you wanna cross where there's natural um, hardened areas. So lots of times, like if you're looking at crossing, maybe you cross at a sandbar, like sandbar to sandbar or gravel bar to gravel bar. Um, and there are some incident instances where you might just have to go straight across and up to the vegetation because it's too steep. Um, 
but we try to try not to make a huge trail. Um, and I, I think as a hiker, you might not create that. But I'm thinking like if you're riding an ATV, those are obviously going to do a lot more, uh, excuse me, damage than like a hiker would, right? So, and it, same thing, you know, try your best to go from point to point. And then if there's already like a trail that people are establishing using, stick to the trail. Don't try to branch out is one, is one way. Cool. Um, how big a deal is set sedimentation and like water quality um, if you don't have vegetation along the shore? Um, so it, it can vary, um, but we like to talk about like, you know, sedimentation. Um, one thing I didn't show in, in the presentation is that salmon need clean, healthy gravel to survive um, from egg incub incubation until they hatch from their eggs. Um, so if you get a lot, a lot of sediment input, you can actually smother and kill a bunch of uh, eggs in that point. Um, and sometimes, you know, it could be as easy like along your property to just get a few trees planted in the area. Um, I'm a big proponent of, we use a lot of alders and willows in what I do because um, they're found naturally. Um, we're trying to incorporate some more uh, cottonwood, but um, a lot of the landowners don't like cottonwood, but those are your, your trees that are gonna really do well along the stream banks because they do well um, being flooded occasionally. But yeah, I, sedimentation can cause some issues um, with, nesting of salmon, especially if it's used to like a clear stream versus um, I think of like glacially fed streams like um, it's a gla uh, Kenai is a glacially fled, fled uh, glacial flood, whatever, I can't speak anymore. Um, the Tanana River is a glacial fed and that one's really sediment. Um, but a lot of the times the salmon are actually traveling up those and going to clear water tributaries, so. Yeah, I hope I answered that question. No, you did. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, does anybody else have any more questions right now? Um, I guess one more question I would have is like, are, are there any, um, what's the most interesting life cycle that you know of that occurs totally in riparian zones? Man, that's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> that's a really hard one. Um, I actually don't know if I can answer that. Like, I think there's just, it's, there's so many different life cycles that in so many different organisms. I was trying to think of in, any of the neotropical, that's the word is neotropical birds. <laughs> um, you know, they, they nest in like, um, the chicks and all that grow within those riparian areas, which is awesome. And they're utilizing, I, I don't know, there's just, it's so complex. It's a spider web, right? So right. it's, yeah. that's cool. If you're thinking about birds that are traveling from Central America to Alaska to um, hatch and have chicks and all that stuff. I think that's really amazing to me. Um, so, but yeah, like I said, um, if I, like if, if I could get this, I, I can't, I can't state enough. Well, you can't even see this, can you? <laughs> there we go this kind of works it's a really cool website um it's a really cool pamphlet I think it, it gives a lot of great information and stuff I may have actually even missed to be honest with you cool so yeah well thanks anybody else have any last questions or anything else that you would like to add Jess you know I, you know thanks for listening to, uh, to me talk it's been a long day today so I apologize um, if I stumbled a little bit but I just want to, you know, thank, thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Melissa, for having me. Um, yeah. And if people have questions or really want to get involved, like just learn more, don't feel free to reach out. Um, a good place to start is like the Matsu Salmon Partnership. Look at that brochure or their little things. They've also got stuff about salmon and invasive species and then some other little tidbits. They've got a whole resource there um, to look at. So it's good opportunities. There's a lot of good, a lot of good things going on in the Matsu Valley. A lot of people, I think, trying to just kind of help and do what they can for our stream, stream corridors or stream banks and all that stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And um, yeah, we'll make sure to get folks in touch with you if 
they have more questions about riparian habitat. This was yeah. awesome. Um, we've been really educating ourselves at uh, Suicide River Coalition about riparian habitat um, even more right now. And uh, there are a few issues in the watershed that we're watching that have to do with riparian habitat. Um, and so one thing that we'd like to point out at Jess is not associated with this is an SRC deal um, that uh, the Matsu Borough is looking at uh, decreasing protections on, on riparian zones and looking at repealing some setback ordinances. Um, and so that's why we uh, are really interested in these areas right now. Um, and if you'd like more information on that, please feel free to reach out to me um, at margaret at suesittenrivercoalition.org or info at suesittenrivercoalition.org. Um, but these are just such cool areas um, and yeah, important for our salmon and we're, we're excited to learn more about them and support them. So thank you so much, Jess. Um, yeah, and thank you. Like I said, people have questions, direct them my way and I'll do my best to answer um, all the questions, so. Awesome, well, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Um, oh, looks like we might have one more. Oh, Sharon says, thank you. Um, have yep. fun backpacking out there, Sharon. <laughs> thank you and have a wonderful evening, everyone. All right, have a good night. Bye.